How would you feel about a guess like uh, 1,249 for the mean? Duh, it's not so bad. It's almost as good as 1,250. How about 1,247? You know, not as good as 1,249, but not bad. How would you feel about 1,100? That's too far out. You'd reject that right away. You see. What we're trying to do in this case is establish two values for eta, a value of eta on the low side and a value of eta on the high side. And the trick is all the values of eta between these two limits would be in a sense a believable in the light of the data. And all values of eta outside these limits would be rejected or would you know, strain our credulity to an extent we'd find it intolerable. What we're really trying to do in this instance is establish an interval estimate for the mean. I tell you, perhaps the best thing to do is to uh, describe this problem in some of its geometric aspects. Now, uh, I just happen to have uh, a properly scaled uh, normal distribution here for our uh, particular problem. You'll recall that we're dealing with the averages, and the average in this case is 1,250. So, as we've observed, the reference distribution for this average is a normal distribution. And pray, what's the uh, distance out to the point of inflection on that normal distribution? Well, it'll be the square root of sigma squared over n, and sigma squared's 10,000, and n is 16. You uh, take the square root of that, and you get uh, 100 over 4, or 25. And you'll notice that, indeed, uh, the standard deviation of a normal distribution appropriate to these averages is equal to 25. And here it is, an appropriately scaled normal distribution. You see how the distance out to the point of inflection there is 25? And now the key question is, what are the reasonable locations for eta in the light of that event? For example, how do you like it when we locate the mean at 1150? Gee whiz, that makes the event a very rare event. How would you like it if I located the mean up here at, uh, well, something like 1230? Well, that's a reasonable location for the distribution because it makes the event a not an unusual event. And so what we're really out to do is find those limits on the location of eta which makes what happened to us not a rare event. Well, it's easy to do the algebra associated with this problem, so what do you say we quickly trundle through the various operations which will provide us with the limits for eta? Now, here's a, a familiar statement. We know that the probability that we'll find a value z between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96 is 95%. Now, let's see what z actually equals in this case. Here's our equation for z. And now, gang, all I'm going to do is I'm going to replace z uh, by that particular expression, as we'll see in the next line. What I've done here, I've dropped off the curly brackets and so forth to keep the thing reasonably clean. And now, what do you say we multiply through these equalities by the denominator here, the square root of sigma squared over n? Let's see what happens when we do that. There we are. That leaves y bar minus 8 in the middle. I think I'll subtract y bar uh, from both sides of these equalities, and let's see that next. Subtracting y bar, now that leaves minus eta standing there in the middle of those inequalities. I'm now going to change the sign of eta. When I do, uh, when you change the signs of inequalities, everything flicks over. This material will appear on this side, and this material will appear on that side, and the inequalities will turn about, and we'll see that final expression here. And so, putting back in the curly brackets, we have the probability that eta will be between these two limits is equal to 95%. This is, in fact, a 95% confidence limits. These are, in fact, the 95% uh, confidence limits, uh, limits for eta are given by a y bar plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of sigma squared over n. What do you say we uh, actually put that up on the board and th then go about uh, getting our uh, data? Are plugged into those equations. We're making a 95% interval statement uh, for the mean. And it's given by the average, plus or minus 1.96, that's that critical value of z, leaving 2.5% in both tails of the curve, times the square root of the variance of that statistic. And if we plug in our data, we get 1250 plus or minus 1.96, 10 to the fourth divided by 16 square rooted. And if we do that calculation, turn the crank there, it comes out 1250 plus or minus 49. Okay, then substituting up here, we would find that um, on the uh, high side, uh, we would have 1299. And uh, on the low side, uh, we would have uh, 1201. And what would be my attitude uh, towards 
uh, these particular limits. My attitude towards these limits is the following. All values of eta which fall within these limits are not contradicted by the data. Now this is called a 95% confidence interval statement for eta. Let's look at it geometrically. Let's see those limits geometrically. One is up at about um, 1300, is it? 1299. And the other is down here about uh, 1200, 1201. Okay. And my attitude towards what I know about eta is that all positions, all values of eta, which lie within these limits, are not contradicted by the data. These are all locations of eta which make the thing that happened to me and not a rare event. My belief in eta is highest at 1250 and sort of slumps off in that fashion. And these are benchmarks. Beyond these limits, I just find the, those values of eta intolerable in the light of the data. Now, I want you to think conceptually of another set of, uh, of 16 observations. Suppose we had taken 16 more observations and the average had come out 1,210. Uh, then we would have constructed another set of confidence limits. Uh, what do you say we do that just for the moment? Imagine another um, uh, situation in which the average was 1,210 based on 16 observations. That would have given me the 1,210 uh, plus or minus 49. And now my interval statement for the mean uh, would have been down as low as 1161 and up as high as 1201. My attitude towards those would be all values of eta which fall within these limits are not contradicted by the data. Uh, this is a 95% confidence interval statement for the mean. About this time, someone will raise his hand and say, um, Stu, gee whiz, have I taken 16 observations on Monday and uh, 16 observations on Tuesday? Um, why don't I just composite all the observations, get 32 observations, get another estimate of the mean, and get another set of confidence intervals? I say, well, uh, that would be a very good idea, uh, but uh, you've missed the point. The thing I want you to think of is the following, you see. I want you to think of all the possible sets of 16 observations that you could have gotten. Each one of those sets would have provided you with an average and ultimately with a confidence interval statement. So you're in a sense stuck with one of the many sets. And I want you to think of all the aggregation of sets of 16 observations that might have occurred to you and their corresponding 95% confidence interval statements. Well, we can see an actual uh, picture of uh, what's going on there uh, over here on the board. And we see uh, repeated trials, you see, of 16 observations. Each set of 16 observations would provide a different average. Yeah. There's the averages right there. And of course, each set would have provided a uh, confidence interval, confidence interval uh, limits uh, for the mean. And you'll notice that most of these intervals do indeed trap beta. But there's an occasional one that does not. You see that? Y bar right there, that's a rare event Y bar, and its interval, you notice, the corresponding interval does not trap eta. That's what we mean when we say it's a 95% interval statement. 95% of the intervals which we construct will, in fact, trap the mean. We only make one interval statement, mind you. We only have one collection of data, but all we know is that 95% of the time we have indeed, you know, trapped eta. It's, um, well, it's a little bit like a fisherman casting a net, and 95% of the time, we catch the fish. Okay. Well, now, we've discussed a lot of very, very interesting topics here. We've talked about one-tailed tests of hypotheses and two-tailed tests of hypotheses, and we've talked about the very important idea of constructing an interval estimate for a parameter. The parameter, in this case, is the mean life of the lamps. Now, pray, what can we do to increase our information relative to the mean life of the lamps? See, that would be reflected by a narrower confidence interval. See, the narrower the confidence interval is in the sense the more you know about the parameter. All right, now how could you narrow that confidence interval? Obviously, one way of learning more about what the parameters are, of narrowing the confidence interval, is to take more data, is to spend more money, increase n. But the difficulties there, if you try to increase n, are the fact that, you know, you're 
diminution of the size of the interval works as the square root of n. And so the additional observations after a certain point of time, uh, their utility, the margin of utility of, different, of additional observations begins to run down. And so we don't really have a, a very useful or practical way of learning more about the, uh, what's going on uh, merely by spending our money. The other thing uh, that we want to, uh, the other thing we can do is to decrease the variance. R, now there's a trick. How could you uh, decrease the variance? And that's really why we're taking a course on the design of experiments. The statisticians are long experienced in dealing with data that have suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous variance. There are tricks. Well, that's unfair. There are techniques, which we will show you in the ensuing lectures and so forth, which will teach you how to combat sources of variability, how to effectively to reduce the variance, if you will, the background noise, so that you can more clearly hear or see the signals which are in the data. And that is why uh, we take a course in the design of experiments. Uh, to learn some of these strategies and, of course, at the same time, to learn some of the uh, corresponding uh, calculation techniques uh, that are involved. Okay. Well, let us say we do review briefly. We've talked about two kinds of hypothesis testing. One is a one-tailed test of hypothesis, and the other alternative is a two-tailed test of hypothesis. Most usually in experimental work, we find ourselves dealing with the one-tailed test, but clearly it is possible to uh, construct a two-tailed uh, test of hypothesis. But the most important thing we've learned really in this lecture concerns the interval estimate for the parameter. What did we find out about the mean of this process? And what we found out about the mean of this process is demonstrated here uh, with the reference distribution and with these two uh, limits. All values of eta which lie between these two limits are not contradicted by the data. We'll never know where eta really is, conceivably, you see? We require an infinite amount of information to do that, an infinite amount of data. But we can nevertheless make such interval statements. And the purpose of taking a course in experimental statistics and taking a course in the design of experiments is to see what we can do to decrease the intrinsic variability uh, that we're dealing against. And once the variation goes down, of course, we will end up with narrower and narrower intervals, you see? And the trick is we'll know more and more about where eta really belongs and our, uh, the value of the data, consequently, are greatly enlarged. And our principal way of going about that is not so much to increase n as to take up arms against the variance which impinges on the data-taking process. Very good. Well, gang, uh, that's been quite a harangue. And so um, I think uh, I'll send you back to your labors and uh, we'll begin another one of these uh, life tests here and find out what we can do uh, to uh, get that wattage back to 60 watts and still extend the life of the lamps even further.